Our final speaker um, that I'm pleased to introduce is Lila Jana. Lila is the founder and CEO of Sama Group. Her company, Sama, sorry, her companies Sama and Luxme were recently highlighted by Fast Company as leading innovators among enterprises that share a common social mission to end global poverty by giving work to people in need. So Sama and Luxme use technology and private sector methods in new ways to measurably improve access to dignified work, critical medical care, and education. Lila is a former management consultant who applies startup techniques to the enterprise under the Sama umbrella. Experimentation, prototyping, and pivoting when the need calls for it are all part of Sama's winning formula. Since 2008, the Sama Group has grown three successful social enterprises and helped cultivate a new industry called impact sourcing. So I can't wait to hear about what that is. One of Lila's business goals for the nonprofit Sama is to make it self funding. To hear how she plans to achieve this objective and to learn more about her approach to combining purpose with innovation, please welcome Lila Jonah. That music makes you feel like such a rock star. I never normally have that. Um, it is such a pleasure to be with you all, and I'm really happy that you're in here and not outside enjoying the beach. Um, although a friend of mine just told me that um, more people die from falling coconuts than from shark attacks every year, so you're probably safer in here. <laughs> so, um, so Perry gave me a great setup. She told you all about how to embed social impact in your business. I'm going to tell you how we do that at Sama, and um, I'm going to argue that there's one particular form of of social impact that you should embed in your business, which is giving work, um, specifically to people who are marginalized and normally cut out of the workforce. Um, and I'm going to tell you why that's really important. That's the core of impact sourcing. So I have two enterprises. One is a nonprofit called Sama, which means equal in Sanskrit. I actually have it tattooed on my right hand. And, and the other is called Luxme. It's a new uh, sustainable skincare brand that will be retailing uh, this fall at Sephora and QVC. And uh, I think we are the only luxury beauty brand that's partly owned by a nonprofit. Some of the nonprofit actually owns an equity share in the business. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about that relationship and how both organizations give work. I hope that these lessons are relevant for you in the credit union industry. I think that many of your customers will find these models really appealing, and I'm hoping that we end up working with co-op on some kind of a business partnership going forward. I'm also going to post a live video of this. There's, there's a live video happening now that's posted to my Facebook page at um, facebook.com slash lilajana, so check that out. I highly recommend, if you guys haven't tried out Facebook Live, that you try it. It's a really great way to extend your reach and grow your platform. So uh, I'm going to tell you a bunch of stories today, and I'm going to start with the story of how I ended up in this field. Um, in high school, I did a lot of community activism. I was a student in Southern California, and I was really involved with the ACLU in advocacy work. And then when I was about 16, a big tobacco company called Lorillard gave me a $10,000 scho uh, college scholarship. So big tobacco ended up helping me start a nonprofit many years later. <laughs> Uh, I ended up going to rural Ghana and teaching English at a school for blind kids. And I was a very optimistic young person. I believed in community service. I thought I was going to go there and, and save all of these poor African children. That was what I had in my, in my head. So I get there thinking that I'm going to teach these kids the very basics. And I was assigned to a middle school class. And my students could name US senators. They could recite quotes from President Clinton's uh, speech that he'd given in, in Africa. They could, um, they could tell me what was going on in the world. They listened to BBC and Voice of America radio. And I got there thinking, like, these kids are so sophisticated. And I have been fed a myth that poor people in developing countries are incapable of helping themselves, that they're incapable of contributing to the global economy, and that they need us to provide handouts of some kind to be better off. My time in Ghana was uh, incredibly depressing in some ways. Um, I, saw, I saw a lot of what I, thought, uh, what I thought of as avoidable poverty. I saw avoidable tragedy all around me. I saw young people dying in my village. Most of the people who lived in the community that I stayed in made less than $2 a day. Uh, I saw women who had to give birth outside of clinics. And I learned about global poverty firsthand. And on the flip side, I became incredibly optimistic 
because my students were so bright. And I knew that just because of an accident of birth, they'd been born in this poor country, but had they been born what I, where I'd been born in the United States, they'd be wildly successful. They'd be doctors and lawyers, they would do really well. And so it struck me that the poverty that they were living in was entirely fixable. It wasn't something that was permanent, it wasn't something that was necessary, it was structural and we could adjust those structures. I ended up going to Harvard and studying international development and later working at the World Bank um, on a world development report on equity. So I got to understand a lot of the statistics that, um, that I really saw firsthand in Ghana. One thing I learned is that a billion people around the world work full time and earn less than $2 a day for their full time output. Um, they are the informal laborers, they are, as Perry mentioned, the cocoa farmers, they are the miners, they're people who are actively engaged, working every day, but not making much money for it. Um, and so that, struck, that stuck with me. I thought, wow, these people are working full time and still unable to earn a living wage, unable to, to cover the basic costs of, of living. I, um, I learned at my time, during my time in Ghana, that the best way to help poor people was not to give them free stuff, was not to give them free goods or free services, but to figure out how to connect them to work. And I learned this over many subsequent years. I did projects in Senegal, I did projects in Rwanda, I traveled all over the world, um, and then working at groups like the World Bank. And I had a lot of time talking to low-income people and understanding what it was that they were looking for out of development programs. And almost universally, they would say, it's wonderful that you're working on this education program. It's great that you're, you've got this group of donors that's building us something, but what we really want is a job. Can you hire me as your cook, as your translator, as your driver? Because I'd like to earn an income, and I'd like to have the freedom and the agency to spend that income on whatever I want, rather than have something handed to me. It's incredibly demeaning, I think, to hand free stuff to people, because it deprives them of choice and agency that we expect in our lives. And I think this is especially true in developing countries in sub-Saharan Africa, where for decades young people have been taught that all that they are capable of is receiving a handout. So this mission of giving work became really important to me very early on, but I struggled to find a way to create good, high-quality jobs in low-income places, because people who live in these regions are disconnected from the global economy. It's really hard to build a big factory that can export stuff in, in a place like rural Ghana. It's really hard when you lack the roads and the waterways and the, and the infrastructure to create stuff for export. And all of the data shows us that uh, in very poor locations, the one thing that you can do to make people less poor is to trade with a richer place on fair terms. We know that, but it's just really hard to do. Well, in 2005, I left undergrad, I went to go work for a management consulting firm, and I was exposed to the global outsourcing industry. I went and met Tom Friedman, uh, who had just written The World is Flat, and I learned about the internet economy, that there was this new type of work that could be done theoretically from anywhere with an internet connection and with electricity that could transcend that barrier that prevented these billions of low-income people from accessing global markets, from accessing opportunity. And this light bulb went off in my head, and I made the connection. I thought, what if I could figure out a way to get young people like the ones I'd met in Ghana, people who have recently finished high school, what if I could figure out a way to get them to connect directly to the internet economy and provide services uh, and make some good money? I decided to quit my job and start Samasource in 2008. I had zero experience other than being a management consultant, which means zero experience in actually operating a business. <laughs> I knew how to tell people, I knew how to BS my way through a lot of meetings, but I knew how to tell people uh, how to, tell people how to you know, run high-level programs, but I had no idea how to operate anything. So it was, it was quite scary. I started with $30,000 in financing from two different business plan competitions. And I wanted to build a model that would take this multi-billion dollar outsourcing industry and, and embed low-income people in it in a fair way. I was really inspired by what Muhammad Yunus had done in the microfinance industry. He won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2006 for his pioneering work in microfinance. And he figured out how to take banking, which was an industry that previously had ignored the poor, and how to engage them in it on fair terms. And I thought, what if I could do the same thing in the outsourcing industry? What if micro work could be to outsourcing what microfinance was to banking? So I launched Sama 
I started with this model that I would go and I would find large technology contracts from Silicon Valley, where I had some connections, and I would figure out a way to get low-income youth from slums in Nairobi, where I had some connections on the ground, to do this work from local computers. And I found a, an entrepreneur who ran an internet cafe. He had just four computers in his tiny little internet cafe in downtown Nairobi. And he was struggling to create a business model that was viable for his internet cafe. He told me, there's no way that people here can afford a dollar an hour for internet access, so do you have another business model for me? So I said, let's, get, let's, let's recruit youth from slums. If you can recruit these young people, if you can make sure that you're recruiting people from genuinely poor areas, and I'll audit you, and if you can pay them a living wage locally, I'll find you contracts from Silicon Valley, and we'll see if this model works. So we started in 2008 with those four computers and with a couple of workers. And now we have grown into a pretty global enterprise. We now employ over 1,000 people full time across East Africa, South Asia, Haiti. And now we have programs across the United States as well. Thank you. <laughs> And it took me many years of basically begging <laughs> to everyone I, I knew to get me connections into large enterprises. But we ended up getting contracts with Google, Microsoft, Walmart, Glassdoor, and all of the companies that you see here and many more. And we, we decided to call what we do impact sourcing, which is this term that basically means sourcing in a way that creates social impact. It sounds so obvious. For us, it's about sourcing in a way that creates jobs for marginalized people. And we believe that that's more than just doing business in Africa. Um, just doing business in Kenya is not enough. We think it's important to go and do business and, and go and hire people who would otherwise not get hired. So in our case, it's people who make less than the local poverty line. So less than about $2.50 a day. And then we move them above that poverty line in the course of doing work for Sama. We have uh, built proprietary technology. We have a platform called the Sama Hub that basically takes these large data projects and breaks them down into small units of work that can be done with less training than would normally be required for a big outsourcing or data project. We've done over 200 million tasks on our platform since we started. We've completed over 200 projects, and we've paid out over $10 million in wages. And these go directly to low-income people and support health and education and other vital needs. And in terms of the total social impact, uh, we've now employed over 7,600 people and their dependents, so about 30,000 people have benefited from, from Sama. So what does that benefit look like? Well, before Sama, we look at all sorts of indicators. We actually have two people working full-time just tracking impact at our organization. So we only hire people who would normally never get hired in the formal economy. These are people who've been day laborers, who've been farmers, uh, who, again, you know, would be uh, invisible to formal employers. And we understand what they spend their money on when they make less than $2.50 a day. They typically live in informal housing. Um, that picture to the left is of a slum called Mathari in Kenya, which I'll tell you a bit more about in a moment. Um, they have poor nutrition. A survey of our workers in Nairobi found that most of them, before they started working with us, were getting the majority of their calories from sugarcane. It's the cheapest source of calories in, in the slum. Uh, they have very limited educational opportunities because they can't afford school fees or they can't afford books, and they have uh, inadequate health care. After Sama, on average, people move to over $8 a day, so we quadruple their incomes. In the world of international development, this is really, really hard to do. Even microfinance, which has made major progress for low-income people, cannot make this kind of a jump. And the reason is that we're connecting people directly to a very lucrative area of the global economy, to internet-based work. This is, I think, the only way you can see these dramatic income gains in a short time. What's really exciting to me is that we've seen that workers stay at this income level for multiple years after they leave Sama. So they're typically getting better paying jobs in the formal economy. This work acts as a stepping stone into other types of jobs. What do they spend their money on when they make more than $8 a day? They quickly move out of the slum. That's one of the first things that people do once they get a Sama job for a couple of months and their income is stable. They buy healthier food. We see changes in the amount of protein and vegetables and fruits that people are consuming. They access higher education. Many of our workers use this money to go and fund college afterwards or school fees for younger people in the home, and they get better access to health care. 
So it's all of the things that we see donors giving to poor people, but that they purchase for themselves. And there's a totally re different relationship that people have when they're using their income to purchase these services and to choose which ones they want than when they're handed them. So I say if you have a choice between making a donation to an organization that provides maybe clean drinking water or builds schools, those are wonderful outcomes. We should support those. And I'm, I'm actually in favor of giving donations, you know, in general to any organization, but I really think that if you target your donations to those organizations that give work, you're solving all of these problems upstream. You're solving them at the root rather than solving them downstream when they're just a symptom of the broader issue of poverty. So I want to tell you a story about a, an individual who, um, who came out of this background. This is a young man named Ken Kihara who I met a couple of years ago, and this is Ken in Mathare. Uh, when I met Ken, he had just started working at Sama, and he told me a little bit about what he was doing before. And I, I hear these stories, and I almost can't believe them. They're just so dramatic that they sound like they're out of a, a novel. They don't sound like they could be real. But this is literally like two minutes away from Ken's house, where I first met him in the slum. And this is called Mathare River which is a euphemism for like a big open sewer. Ken used to, um, used to go and collect recycling materials. He'd collect scrap metal and bits of plastic that he'd find in this river and sell them to the local recycler for about a dollar and 10 cents a day. He worked uh, brewing a local moonshine called Chang'a, which a lot of the young people in the slums drink, which is in those big containers there. They actually suck the water from that river and brew this really awful stuff they mix it with kerosene, and they sell it to make a little bit of money. It's an epidemic in the slum. A lot of young people have brain damage because they're drinking this stuff, and Ken used to sell it. And he had to do that because he lacked any other sort of income. Ken decided to join our program after a friend of his mentioned that there was a computer center that had just opened up on the outskirts of Mathare. So he took a chance, and he showed up, and he started learning uh, how to use computers. And he, he was totally transformed. He got so excited. So he took this class, and then he ended up getting a job with us doing data entry. And that job led to him becoming a team leader. And after he was a team leader, our team noticed how dedicated he was, and we decided to hire him ourselves. And now Ken works as a trainer in Mathari. He's left the slum. He's moved out with his wife and daughter. His daughter goes to a better school. And his life has completely transformed. His income has gone up by more than five times. And uh, he's now an advocate for young people who lived like him previously but who want to escape poverty. So this is what's possible. This jump from poverty to prosperity is what's possible when we think about giving work as opposed to giving aid or traditional handouts. We have implemented this model here in the United States as well. Um, this is a man named Gary who I met last year in Arkansas. We decided in 2012 that we might take the leap to try to adapt our model of impact sourcing to work here in the US. Right now, there's this huge division between international NGOs and domestic organizations, even in terms of funding. I was just told by a funder two days ago that we couldn't get funding because we do too much work internationally. And I was like, this makes absolutely no sense. I think that a lot of the problems that we see domestically um, are reflected in problems we see internationally. And if we have nonprofits um, that do work in both geographies, those learnings can, can apply across both. We've learned a lot of stuff in Kenya and Uganda and India that might be relevant to rural communities here in the US. So in 2012, we started Sama School, our first domestic program, and we decided to take our experience in teaching low-income people how to benefit from digital work and turn it into a training program. So we started training people to benefit from the gig economy. The um, transition to gig or contract work has taken our economy by storm. You guys probably know this, um, probably seen an increase in deposits from people who are working on a lot of these, these gig economy platforms. Um, websites like TaskRabbit and Thumbtack and Odesk and Elance, which combine to form a site called Upwork, have grown really, really dramatically. And these are all sites that let people work essentially as independent contractors. We're seeing this with Lyft and Uber. We're seeing it with companies like Style Seat, which does this for independent stylists. So this is a revolution that's happening in our economy. And our view is that low-income people are not prepared for this revolution. 
our federally funded job training programs don't mention anything about the gig economy. We don't train low-income people how to file self-employment taxes. We don't teach them how to think entrepreneurially about marketing their skills as an independent business owner or thinking of themselves as someone who might be an independent contractor on one of these platforms. So we formed Sama School. We started putting the curriculum out there. We put all of our curriculum online at samaschool.org. We now have over 10,000 people who are full-time enrolled in our course. And we've had some really interesting outcomes. So this man, Gary, uh, lives in rural Arkansas in a town of about 500 people. We set up a program there to test whether this model would work in the Mississippi River Delta, one of the poorest parts of our country. Gary is a veteran and he used to work for a local dog food factory that had opened in Arkansas. And when it shut down, he had the toughest time finding work. Despite the fact that he had a lot of good experience as a veteran, despite the fact that he was really hardworking, there were just no local jobs. And it's interesting to me that rural Arkansas looks a lot like rural Uganda in terms of job prospects. If you want to get a job, you have to drive two, or two and a half or three hours to the nearest big city. And that just wasn't viable for Gary. So enter internet-based work. We, uh, we taught Gary how to do virtual call center work, and then we found him a job with a virtual call center. So he now works from inside his trailer. He's able to make much more than the local living wage, I think a couple dollars an hour more, which is really significant in a place uh, like the one where he's from. And he's able to support his family with this income in rural Arkansas. This is something that would never have occurred to people like Gary, and it's something that we don't train low-income people to benefit from. And I think that if we want to see a reduction in unemployment and poverty in this country, we have to start teaching low-income people how to benefit from the internet economy. So this mission of give work um, inspired me a couple of years ago to think about other ways we might extend our social mission and possibly build a for-profit model alongside Sama. If I were to start our organization today, I don't know that I would start us as a nonprofit. Um, this year, we'll break even off of our earned revenue. Um, it's, uh, it's been a long eight years getting here. But be be before this point, we had to spend a lot of time fundraising. I've run galas every year. I've had to go out to every rich person I know and ask for money, and it's just not sustainable. And so I thought, what if we could build a for-profit version of Sama that would work alongside the nonprofit? What if we could give a significant equity grant to the nonprofit? maybe be the first of our kind to do that in a new category. And, uh, and I started looking for businesses that could apply this model of impact sourcing in different sectors. I uh, spent some time near the source of the Nile River in northern Uganda. This is actually a picture of me at the Nile last year. And I started looking for organic ingredients that we might use in a skincare line. And I had the idea because I went to a local market and I discovered this amazing product called Nilotica, which is East African shea. Unlike West African Shea, which has made its way into many consumer products, L'Oreal and L'Occitane have products that use this Shea, East African Shea has been totally undeveloped as a market. And in this region, it's been undeveloped because Northern Uganda was in a civil war for 20 years, so nobody was exporting it. So I thought, what if we could take these nuts and build the same kind of a story and the same kind of a business around them the way that we did with Sama? And what was appealing to me about this idea is that Sama can only employ people who are literate and who are within range of, of electricity and an internet connection. So it's really not for everyone. And uh, as Perry mentioned, there are over 600 million smallholder farmers who are agriculturalists who don't have access to any of those resources. So for me, this was a way for our social mi mission to reach deeper and to go uh, to those people who made maybe less than $1 a day and had zero resources and zero connectivity. Um, so I started learning more about how sourcing of these nuts works and learned that all of the work is done by local women and that we could create a really beautiful terroir story around these nuts. And it's my belief that um, if we can move the fair trade and organic and natural space, at least some of those products into the luxury space with better branding and better storytelling, um, we're going to do a much better service to the people at the bottom of the supply chain. So, 
we thought about building a luxury brand, and it ended up uh, emerging as Lakshmi. We started selling in November last year. So we're a new luxury skincare brand. I hope eventually we're able to move into other types of goods. And the premise is that we go out and source rare ingredients, and we do that sustainably in partnership with local cooperatives and uh, uh, and by telling this story of unique, rare ingredients that have an amazing natural provenance. And we believe in full transparency, so on our site, when you go, um, when you go on our site, you can type in the harvest number, so a number on each product, and actually see exactly where it comes from. Eventually, you'll be able to see the harvesters who made it on our website, which I don't think anyone has done before in beauty. We've taken uh, the give work tagline of Sama, and, uh, and transformed it into Works Wonders. The idea is that the products work on your skin and also generate work for low-income people. And I'm really excited about our branding because I think one thing that uh, we've learned in the social impact space is that product is king, right? We always think if you care about social mission, if you run a nonprofit as I do, you imagine that other people are as passionate about social impact as you are. Consumers want to buy products that they feel, especially in the beauty category, that they feel are going to make them more beautiful. Um, they're gonna, they want to buy food that tastes good, <laughs> as Perry mentioned. So um, we've really emphasized brand and look and feel, and I hope that we end up pioneering a new kind of fair trade model that emphasizes marketing and storytelling just as much as we emphasize social impact, so that the social impact doesn't trump the product benefit to the consumer. Um, I want to end with a, a final story about a young woman that has been working at Sama for many years. And I also want to end with a call to action and, a, and an appeal to each of you to get involved in this mission. This woman is named Martha Kerubo. Uh, she also comes from Nairobi. And I met her when she was about 19 years old. She'd been orphaned for most of her life, I think since she was about eight. And uh, Martha, when she first came into our program, would look at her feet, would mumble when she spoke to you. She would wear extremely baggy clothes. She lacked any self-confidence. Um, she had aged out of her orphanage at 18 and was on the street and was unsure of where she was going to live and what was going to happen to her. She was pretty sure she would end up going into the sex trade, as a lot of her friends were forced to do in Nairobi. And then she found our computer center and had a similar story as Ken, and now lives on, on her own in a really nice apartment in a safe area of Nairobi. This transformation is possible for all of the billion people who are living in extreme poverty today. We do not have to accept that this continues in our lifetime, abroad or domestically. And I think if each of us thinks about how, in your case, how your customers might add a give work component to their business, if you're hiring suppliers, how you might hire suppliers that have a strong social mission, that are social enterprises that employ marginalized people, we can all contribute to stories like Martha's. We can all contribute to ending poverty and ending all of the negative consequences to society um, that come from that. So I'm going to end here and uh, open it up to questions. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you.